Soon may the weller man come Bring us coffee, tea and rum One day the tongue is done Take our leave and go Had a fair The lake level is slowly being drawn down to winter pool and Bridget, my O'Day Osprey, is beginning to run out of water at her dock. Keeping her in the water has allowed me to do a lot more sailing than I typically would when trailering. I've enjoyed a lot of days and afternoons on the water this summer, but I've had a notion of camping out of this boat and it's finally time to put the plan into action. I load Bridget down with a big cooler, a small tent, and a 50 liter dry bag filled with all the basic essentials. The wind has been almost always out of the northeast when I've sailed from this dock, and I never have any difficulty paddling the short distance out to more open water, usually with the sails up. I have to push the boat backwards out to better water in order to keep the rudder from dragging, and then once I get out, I can turn her around using the paddle. In the process, the south wind gusts up at exactly the wrong time and almost puts me into the neighbor's dock. With a few strokes of the canoe paddle, I manage to dodge the dock, but end up grounded out on the opposite bank. That was a little bit embarrassing. I hope the neighbor didn't see that. That minor obstacle would be my first taste of my initiation to sailing with a southerly wind on Kentucky Lake. I was planning to cross Kentucky Lake from the western side to the eastern side, slowly making my way to Smith Bay, which was about six miles away in land between the lakes. I've been across once before in this boat, but that was in very light conditions. The breeze was stiff and steady, and Bridget was chugging along. I felt pretty optimistic about making a crossing. Out ahead of Goose Island, I was seeing a few white caps, but really didn't look too bad. The further I got out to open water, the more I realized that the sea state was very different than what I normally encounter on the lake. The wind speed was brisk, but certainly nothing alarming and no reason to even shorten sail. What bothered me was the waves. The waves were surprisingly and unusually large and also very close together that can make for a very bumpy ride. Saltwater sailors may scoff at this, but this was a little bit unusual for what I commonly encounter on these waters. The roughness of the waves doesn't really come through on the video, but for what I was feeling at the time, I just didn't feel comfortable making the crossing at that moment, as I knew it was likely to only worsen throughout the day, as it was still early in the morning, and also would probably be worse the further out I got. On top of that, the wind direction was really not ideal at this moment. It was more southeast and was predicted to shift south and eventually southwest later in the day. So I decided the smart decision would be to just turn downwind and enjoy some sailing while I wait out the conditions and 
hope that the wind would shift to the southwest eventually, and that the rough seas would calm down a bit. For my type of sailing, I'm used to being in very protected waters, and I rarely encounter any type of real waves or seas at all. Normally this route would have me close reaching and close hauled on a northeast wind. Needless to say, running with the southerly, I made Sled Creek in record time. Probably about a quarter of the time that it would normally take me sailing on the wind. I'm enjoying this downwind sailing, but I don't want to get too far away from the point where I need to make my crossing. So I gradually round up and begin about an hour long short tacking drill. You can start to get a better sense of the rough water conditions here, and the wind is gradually picking up blowing directly down the length of the lake and that in turn whips up the big white capping waves and once the waves get started they just continue even if the wind dies down you still have that rough water state. Tacking single-handed in these conditions is a bit of a scramble. I was actually enjoying it though. Finally, the blustery south wind seems to be reaching its crescendo, and after beating for maybe a mile or two, I was getting wet and starting to get a little bit fatigued. So luckily there was a creek nearby, and I bring the boat around one last time and tuck away into the creek.
it's amazingly calm as I come into the lee of the point. Bridget and I rest sitting on anchor as we wait for the conditions to improve and hopefully for the wind to shift to the southwest. A couple hours later, the sun has come out and conditions are looking much calmer and more favorable for a lake crossing. Before setting out in earnest, I scan north and south looking for commercial traffic in the Tennessee River Channel. That's probably the main hazard to watch out for in a small boat, and especially a small sailing dinghy like this without a motor. more south than southeast now, which isn't ideal, but it's good enough to make the crossing, and I may not get another chance today. Bridget and I are close reaching to the east, cutting across the width of the lake, and just slightly to the south. Ideally, we need that southwest wind, and then we can go at more of a diagonal to reach Smith Bay, which is about six miles southeast of my starting point. If it doesn't shift, then we'll have to be short tacking up the river channel, and that's not ideal, but that's just sailing. Soon I draw near the mangled tree line of Moss Creek on the eastern shoreline of Kentucky Lake. Bridget and I have followed almost exactly the route of a devastating tornado that hit this region a couple years ago. First time this day, luck was with us. As we came into the Tennessee Riverbed, the wind finally shifted to the southwest as predicted. We would now be able to maintain a straight line course, close reaching directly down the riverbed to the south, and finally turning off at Smith Bay. Despite the wind having shifted to the southwest, the waves are still rolling down the length of the lake, directly out of the south. To me, this is somewhat of an oddity to be sailing close hauled at a 90 degree angle going directly into the waves. I'm 
constantly using the binoculars to scan for commercial barges as I want to see them far, far away so that I have plenty of time to react. I got lucky with a shift in the wind. It's been southeast all day. Finally, the wind shifted to the southwest, and now here I am at Smith Bay. Smith Bay is a really unique and beautiful place in LBL. It's surrounded by big sandy beaches that will make you feel like you're on a seaside vacation somewhere. The entire bay isn't sand, but there are multiple sandy areas on either side of the bay. And sometimes when I trailer to this location with my smaller boats, I like to hop around from beach to beach, and that makes a nice day outing. There was a very slight chance of thunderstorms in the forecast for late that night, early the next morning, and I really wasn't too worried about it, but keeping that in mind, I decided to make camp on the most protected of all the beaches, and I set up my tent just in the wood line on a sand dune, that would allow me to get behind it for shelter if it came down to it. There was a pretty deep pocket behind this sand dune where I could get down low in a uniform patch of trees if any lightning strikes happened to come in very close. I had checked multiple resources, including the National Weather Service, and they all seemed to concur. It was roughly a 30% chance of thunderstorms around 5 in the morning. Come about 7.30 in the evening, I was already seeing some very dark clouds moving in, and I was getting a little bit of a lightning show. It seemed to be moving from southwest to northeast with the prevailing wind of the day, and came close enough to watch the show, but rarely came close enough to actually hear any thunder. Around 1 a.m. I was rudely awakened by some deafening thunderclaps and bright flashes of lightning. That was a jarring experience and the lightning was close enough over the bay and the thunder was loud enough that I decided probably should duck behind the dune for a little bit. So I did go down in that depression and sit on a boat cushion, had a poncho with me and a little bit of water and I just waited it out. Dark clouds continued to pass over the bay from the southwest all morning. I was able to enjoy two cups of cowboy coffee and complete some camp chores until this lone crow began flying circles around Bridget's mast, warning us of more foul weather yet to arrive.
This was a fine time to discover a leak in one of the seams of my rain fly. I stayed dry for the most part, but a small puddle formed in the bottom of the tent. Like the continuous thunderstorms from the previous night, this downpour was also not predicted. The plants and wildlife will be happy to have it though, as this area has not seen any rain in about three weeks. For the next several hours until noon, it would rain heavily for about 10 or 20 minutes, then the sun would come out for 10 or 20 minutes, then it would rain again. Somehow I managed to get all my camp tasks and packing up done in the interlude between rains. Camping on sand is nice and perfectly manageable unless everything happens to get soaked then the sand just sticks. I've discovered the secret is to let everything thoroughly dry out then you can simply shake the sand out. From all the rain and rough water sailing, Bridget was soaked up to the floorboards. I can tolerate a little bit of bilge water, but this is the point where I decide to go ahead and pump it out. The rain was expected to pass and the sun to come out around noon. The farther I get out to open water, the greater the strength of the wind and waves, and pretty quickly I realized this is even rougher than what I thought was rough yesterday. On the next installment of the Cumberland Rover, Bridget and I take on our biggest challenge so far, an unexpected rough water crossing from Smith Bay to Cambridge. These are the biggest waves I've sailed in to this point, and looking around, there's not another boat in sight. It's just me and Bridget, a 16-foot centerboarder, 